Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Sherry, and happy holidays. We really appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to expand and grow, as you'll see right after the first of the year. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a new quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as the sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Happy holidays, everybody. This is Jeff. This week, Kim and I are taking a little time off to bring you a replay of our November 2018 interview with Dr. Samuel Ramsey. This is one of our favorite episodes as it was recorded not long after his groundbreaking paper on the feeding habits of the Varroa mite was released. The Varroa mite is a pest that defines our year in our bee yards, and even if you've heard this interview before, we encourage you to listen to it again as we may pick up some more information that you missed the first time through about this devastating parasite. We will be back on January 4th with a new episode talking with Tom Theobald about two queen honey production. Now that's a technique I'm sure very few have ever attempted and I'm sure you'll want to listen to it. With that, let's get right into our November 2018 interview with Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Well, great. We have now with us Dr. Samuel Ramsey, and it's been a a great uh, opportunity to get Dr. Ramsey on the phone with us and uh, talk to us about his latest research and everything else that's going on in his life. Thanks for being here. Of course. It's a pleasure. (laughs) Just Just a quick question, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, where are you right now and who do you work for? So we got a good feel for your background and, and, and your presence. Sure. So <laughs> I work for the, uh, the Honeybee Research Lab. Uh, it's a part of the United States Department of Agriculture, so one of their departments. Uh, and my work is, at this point, really just focusing on figuring out how to weaponize the things that I discovered during my Ph.D., so now that we know what the varroa mite is eating, now it's time uh, to figure out how to use that to kill it. <laughs> uh, about as succinct as you can get, but that's that's why we're here today. What have you found relative to what you just said? That's that's the background that people are, I think, are interested. Oh, in. for sure. Uh, it's it's funny uh, that I've kind of. Uh, started to get notoriety based off of uh, this this fat body discovery because people have been referring to me as the fat body guy. Uh, <laughs> should you ever meet me in person, uh, you'll find that that is not the most apt description of me, but <laughs> we'll, we'll go with it. I like it. <laughs> so I've become the fat body guy, um, and specifically because there is, uh, for a very long time now, for several decades, it's been said that the parasite, the the most damaging parasite that's um, uh, that that can be found in honeybee colonies right now, uh, it's been said that it's feeding on the bee's blood. Uh, and my work has actually found that it's feeding on a specific organ called the fat body. Um, the the fat body is different from just body fat. I hear a lot of people try to um, uh, to summarize things and say, uh, you know, Dr. Ramsey's work has shown that varroa destructor feed on body fat and not blood, but it's actually very different from that because the fat body, while uh, it does uh, encompass most of the body fat of the bee, uh, it is an organ that has nine essential functions that it conducts inside of the bees to keep them healthy. Uh, Everything from uh, its involvement with immune function to pesticide detoxification, it balances and regulates hormones, it creates 
um, a, a number of different proteins that the bees need. It's actually the, the primary place where proteins are made in the bee's body. It does a lot of important stuff. So hmm. That's analogous to a human liver then. Yeah, yeah. It's very similar uh, to the human liver um, in, in a number of different ways. Uh, there's also uh, some, some functions that it conducts that aren't analogous uh, to, uh, to the human liver because there's just things that bees need to do that we don't do. But uh, it's, it's a very important uh, set of tissue. It's a very important organ. And uh, I think people are really starting to pick up on that more now than they have in the past. Well, I know there's a, a, a uh, some of the people that you worked on on, on this project uh, has have some history with this. Can you go back a little bit and give us? You know, a lot of people didn't pick up yeah. on this, and 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 the question is not the question isn't why, but how 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 did you guys pick For up? Sure. On it? Um, so I I love getting that question because it's important to me to be able to to let people know that this did not happen in a vacuum. Um, but there were uh, a number of people involved in this process. And so um, Alan Cohen, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, but Alan Cohen, uh, he's one of the researchers who um, uh, was on the, the seminal paper describing the, the, the excrement produced by Varroa. And uh, it's weird to talk about excrement when you're uh, talking <laughs> about insects, but you can learn a lot about a creature from what it excretes. And so uh, they they described the excrement of this organism, and it wasn't the sort of excrement that you would typically expect from a creature that's feeding on blood, um, but specifically on, on blood that's so dilute in its nutrient content. Um, and so he that that seems to have been something that um, Dr. Cohen thought was pretty strange, strange enough for it to to bother him. And he talked about it with uh, a couple of researchers. I know he mentioned it to uh, Jamie Ellis and he mentioned it to Dennis Van Engelsdorp uh, and just saying, you know, there, there might be more to this story than uh, these, these uh, mites feeding on the bee's blood. They're probably feeding on something else entirely. And so uh, I know Dennis had been processing this for a while. Dr. Ellis had been processing this for a while. And so um, when I joined Dennis's lab, uh, he threw out this idea to me, well, you know, maybe you could, since you're so interested in parasites and symbiosis and relationships between organisms, uh, and since you've got experience looking at, at parasites, why don't you look at this varroa mite and see if uh, maybe there's something interesting going on with the feeding? Uh, and so it, it was kind of a, a, a big shot in the dark there because there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of options for tissue. There's a lot of things going on inside of uh, a bee's body, but the more I started to dig through the layers of uh, what was going on, starting from the excrement and working all the way through all the other things that came up as a result of, of studying that, um, uh, it eventually led to uh, a bunch of experiments that brought us to a very clear con conclusion that they're feeding on the, the fat body of the bees. And that's of the larva as well, right? Because yep. it, all the current literature or up until this year said that it primarily fed on the uh, the larva and 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 bred underneath the the cap and so everything was happening there so what made you look at what was actually going on on the bee as opposed to looking at the larva see now this is the part where um my inexperience with honeybees actually served me so uh, i've been an entomologist for pretty much ever um, I've been interested in studying insects since I was seven. I told my parents when I was a seven-year-old that I was going to be an entomologist when I grew up. Uh, so I've had a lot of interest in several different kinds of insects, but I've never been a beekeeper. Uh, I've never spent an extensive amount of time studying bees specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. And so when I jumped into this, I felt totally inadequate because honeybees are extremely complicated. Their societies are complicated. Their body plans are, are, are interesting and, and really, really complex. Uh, and so I wanted to know everything there was to know uh, about the, the dynamics uh, as far as the honeybees go, as well as the parasite. And so I did a lot of research on the biology of Varroa. Uh, I wanted to know everything from the start. So I went back to the first paper where Varroa was described in 1904 and then tried mm -hmm. to look at all the papers since then uh, in the most extensive <laughs> literature search that I could do uh, to understand this creature. Uh, and I think the other thing that's really served me in this um, has been the fact that I look at a lot of these matters 
from the perspective of the parasite rather than just the host. Um, and so a, a lot of researchers have tackled this from the direction of looking at it from top down, from the bees down to the mites. But looking at it from the mites up to the bees, uh, it seemed odd that the mites would waste uh, such an important resource as the adult bees uh, and the important tissues that the adult bees have, especially since the mite's body uh, is very well, this was uh, actually described in, in 1904 by uh, Dr. Eudemons, who <laughs> described these organisms. Um, but he described that the, the domed nature and uh, sort of ellipsoid flattened body that they have would be perfect for fitting between uh, the plates that make up the adult bee's body. Uh, and it, it was really interesting looking at that because when I would collect bees from the colonies, I would find them between these plates. Uh, and when I would separate the plates to look at what's uh, in between them, uh, there's this really thin membrane. I ripped it pretty much every time I separated those plates on the bee. But there's this really thin membrane that the mites could potentially be feeding through. Uh, and when we did more research on the physiology of the bees, uh, directly under that membrane is the fat body tissue. Um, so I wanted to look at uh, how the mites were impacting the adults because that led us to a really important, um, uh, a really important implication. We have natural brood breaks, but we also periodically uh, create these artificial brood breaks. And that would force the entire population of mites from the larvae onto the adult bees. And if the mites are actually impacting the adult bees, this may actually be more damaging and more risky um, than we've considered in the past. And it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad idea, but we should be considering that risk. And we're moving this whole population because if they are feeding on the adult bees, they're bringing with them uh, all those viruses and all the damage that they cause in the process of feeding. Uh, they're moving all of that into the adult population all at one time. And that wow. could be really damaging at certain times of year. So uh, I wanted to look at that and see if I could um, verify and determine pretty clearly whether they were feeding on the adult bees or not. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the implication in some of the literature is that they aren't while other researchers have uh, assumed that, well, they, they have to be feeding on the adult bees because if you put them, um, if you separate them from adult bees uh, for more than a couple of days, they die. If you leave them with adult bees, um, they survive. And so they're probably deriving some sort of nutrition from the adult bees. Um, but uh, to, to directly show that is really, really difficult. And so um, some of my work focused on the adult bees, some of it focused on the larvae, and it was able to bring together a more holistic uh, idea of how the mites are impacting the entire organism. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, 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 that's a good... So, uh, the, the, the thing that comes up to me right off the top of that is that one of the management techniques that beekeepers routinely recommend is to uh, artificially uh, create a brood break so that you expose mites you get mites out of there. There's no mites mm -hmm. in cells and they're all exposed on adults and therefore more likely to come in contact with whatever treatment you're using. Precisely. If I, if I understand what you just said, that may be the worst thing we can do. I wouldn't say the worst thing, uh, but I would say that it is definitely more risky than we have considered in the past. Uh, and that's yes. not a guess. Uh, that is, that is clear based on the work that, um, that we've been conducting because, um, and, and that comes from an issue that we've had in the past with terminology. Uh, when Varroa was first described, it was described in the former Soviet, well, okay, uh, when several of the fundamentals of Varroa's behavior and biology was described, uh, a lot of that was described uh, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and a lot of the work that was written about them was written uh, in Russian. Uh, and so a lot of those papers have been very difficult for us to actually read. Uh, and so for, for, for a lot of work that was done about Varroa, we um, would just look at the abstract from those papers because that was the only part translated into English. And there was never really verification done on uh, the methods or a lot of the work conducted for some of the other uh, work done there. And so Varroa, their life cycle was separated into two phases the phoretic phase, and the reproductive phase. And we understand that in the reproductive phase, reproduction occurs. But the term phoresy 
uh, is a, a term that people don't hear very frequently, and uh, it, it's just not common vernacular. But forasi, uh, it, it comes from the Greek word, uh, for, uh, to, which means to bear. Uh, it, it means to, to take something and move it. Uh, and the idea of forasi is that a creature uh, is only used as a shuttle, uh, as a means of transportation to move one organism to another place. Uh, that creature is not being used uh, as a trophic resource, so it's not being fed on, uh, and it's not being used as a reproductive resource. And so in order for Varroa to actually be phoretic, they cannot feed on adult bees, period. No feeding whatsoever. Um, and so for a long time, uh, because we've been using this term to describe Varroa for so long, um, I, I think uh, there's been, a, 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 people have somewhat taken for granted that Varroa actually impact the adult bees. We kind of think of them uh, as simply using the bees as buses to get them from either a colony, one colony to another, to get them from one brood cell to another brood cell, uh, or to switch between adult bees. The problem there, of course, uh, is that if they're simply trying to get from one brood cell to the next, they don't need to stay on adult bees for seven to 14 days, which is uh, the, the average amount of time that they're staying on adult bees. Uh, mm -hmm. And if they're trying to get outside of the colony and fly from colony to colony, they should be attaching to foragers. But the literature shows very clearly that they prefer nurse bees. Uh, so there's something, there was, those were some of the things that led me to believe they're probably feeding on the adult bee populace as well. Um, through my work, I've been able to show that they do feed, and they feed a substantial amount uh, on adult bees. And so what you said a moment ago is actually very true. Um, there is a substantial risk to us forcing the entire population of mites, uh, especially if this is a colony where uh, there's a lot of mites in the brood, uh, usually uh, 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 the, the majority of the population uh, at any one time is going to be in the brood. Uh, and so if you force a large number of mites onto the adult bees, and we know that these mites are damaging uh, the, the tissue that uh, is in charge of the immune system, them, the tissue that's in charge of pesticide detoxification, the tissue that's in charge of uh, their, their hormonal balance, which regulates task shifting and all of these other matters, uh, you're creating a lot of chaos in your adult bee populace. And worse still, you're creating a lot of chaos in the most important part of your, uh, well, arguably the most important part of your, your populace, because you've got the nurse bees that uh, they're maintaining this huge complement of nutrition for the colony uh, in their fat bodies. They're feeding uh, the babies. They're making sure that the next generation uh, for these bees can then be carried on. And uh, they're walking around, there's attendants that uh, are also feeding uh, the nurse and making, or the queen and making sure that she has all the nutrition that she needs to continue producing enough eggs for the colony. So we've got uh, a lot of viruses that can then easily be transmitted and disseminated throughout the entire uh, adult bee populace as they go about uh, feeding each other, as they have these uh, heavily weakened immune systems. It allows for viruses to travel a lot more quickly now that they have compromised immune systems because of these mites uh, and all of the other issues that we were just detailing uh, that come about here. Uh, we would expect that they would get a lot worse uh, when we force these brood breaks and uh, the longer we allow these mites to continue feeding on the adults. Let me bring back the word chaos here because that's that's what this is relative to fundamental management of Varroa right now. Uh, <clears throat> I, can, I, can, I can tell you a hundred researchers that will give a talk in the next three days this weekend somewhere, somebody will say a force a force brood break is a good way to control because it exposes the adult bees to uh, whatever treatment you're doing or to being being hygienically removed or whatever, whatever. And that is true. Uh, it does force uh, the, the mites to be in greater exposure to the pesticides. Uh, and it does force them into a section of their life cycle that is more vulnerable uh, for grooming. Um, but we have thought of it as if there, when we do risk benefit analysis, we have to have accurate information. You cannot do a risk benefit analysis without adequate knowledge of what the risks are and the benefits. We've had a good idea of what the benefits are, uh, and we have not had a good idea of what the risks are. And I think uh, in, in that way, yeah. we've had a, a, a probably more flowery idea uh, of, the, <laughs> uh, of how helpful a brood break is than how it actually is. Yep. Interesting. Why? Wow, interesting is exactly right. 
amazing is what that is. Well, then, then uh, taking another step, Dr. Ramsey, if you were to develop some sort of management program for Varroa in a beehive using this information, where would you go with it? What, what's, what's at the top of your list? Have you, have you taken it that far? Let me put it that way, because you may not have. I realize that the fundamental work you've done here is pretty amazing. Next step, of course, is to is to the application yes. of this. And do you have some thoughts? Uh, I, I do have some thoughts about this. And uh, I, I would uh, like to say right now, um, there is certainly a lot more thinking that I would like to do about this. <laughs> um, my project, I was really excited about it. Uh, because of all the ways that it allowed me to apply different layers uh, of, you know, the, the the knowledge base that I've built up in the last 21 years of, of studying insects. Um, and so it was a really multifaceted project, but the place where it was most lacking was an application. Uh, and there are other uh, students that, you know, uh, who were PhD students at the same time as me. Uh, Natalie Steinhauer is one name that comes to mind also. Uh, Kelly Kohanek, uh, I loved how applicable their projects were. Natalie was studying um, how the uh, the different undertakings that we have as beekeepers, how they actually impact the colony and how we perceive that they will impact the colony and sort of the disconnect uh, between them. And it was an absolutely fascinating project because she was able to take all of that information from the um, the, the, the be informed partnerships, collections, the loss and management surveys, uh, and look at what was actually um, statistically the most likely to lead to uh, your, your colonies surviving the winter, surviving the summer, uh, and all of that. So, so it, was, it was really enlightening. I got to say, I was a little bit jealous of how cool and uh, applicable uh, that project was. And you guys should totally have her on for a podcast at some point. But anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, if I, <laughs> right, right I'm writing it down. It's 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 recorded. It's uh, we're we're set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, your your question about what I would recommend. Um, I've had a, a lot of time to think about it, and there's still a lot more thinking that I'd like to do. But uh, I have uh, a good deal of reticence now um, about being too. Uh, too quick to recommend brood breaks. I think we need to spend a little bit more time um, uh, really looking at whether uh, uh, vir viruses are, are more uh, heavily distributed in the colony during brood breaks and uh, really looking at the health metrics of the bees during these times. Um, but really, I think what we should be looking for is a way to impact the population of mites that are actually below the capping. What we do now is uh, we add things like uh, amitraz or formic acid uh, into the colony, and we want to uh, allow for these chemicals to be present in the colony long enough so that the, the brood that is currently capped, the mites that are leaving that brood will be exposed to the pesticide. And so then you have to leave it in there long enough for that, uh, for that exposure. Um, but I think if we can find a way to expose the mites to pesticides below the capping, that would be wonderful. That would be like uh, that. That would be a great way uh, for us to impact the population of reproductive mites because then we could have a shorter term exposure uh, with these chemicals, uh, and we can really uh, uh, reduce the population where uh, the greatest number of organisms uh, actually are, the greatest number of the parasites. Um, we know that. Formic acid can penetrate the capping. Uh, we need uh, there to, of course, be greater research on what's the most effective dosage, temperature, humidity, uh, to make sure that the cappings are penetrated and what level of kill we can expect uh, when penetrating the capping. And uh, there's still work to be done there. Um, but if I were to, uh, and, and remember, this is still unverified, but if I were to uh, speculate and to think through what I would expect to have uh, a really heavy um, effect on the population. I would expect it to be during the reproductive phase because not only is uh, the foundress mite inside of that cell uh, reproducing, but her entire family, uh, the offspring that she produces, they are by far at their most vulnerable stage. 
They can't do anything for themselves. They can't even feed by themselves. If she doesn't make a hole uh, in that bee for them to feed through, all of them will die because their mouth parts are totally squishy uh, and they, they're not strong <laughs> enough to actually pierce through the larva uh, themselves. Uh, and so uh, their helplessness, uh, if you can penetrate the capping, even if you were to just kill uh, her off and her eggs still hatch, uh, they wouldn't be able to take care of themselves at that point. And also they are extremely, extremely vulnerable during that stage because of how uh, thin and absorbent their own uh, exoskeleton is. It doesn't have the opportunity to solidify and harden until the very end uh, of their development, until the point where they mature and are ready to leave that cell themselves. Uh, so the exposure of pesticides during that point can kill the entire family of mites uh, that's then de developing. So I think we really need to find something um, that uh, to, we really need to refine our methods of impacting the reproductive phase uh, in addition to uh, the phase that's on adult bees uh, because more of them are in the brood than are on the adult bees at pretty much any time in the year except when there is no brood. In addition to that, um, well, one more uh, addendum to that, um, we need to reduce the amount of chemicals that we're putting into the colony. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so data <laughs> that has uh, data from the Be Informed Partnership and data from uh, uh, other uh, uh, research agencies has shown uh, that when we look at the chemicals that the bees are exposed to on a regular basis, there's a lot of concern about the neonicotinoids and uh, all the other chemicals that are out in the environment, the fungicides, the herbicides. By far their greatest exposure to pesticides, the bees themselves, uh, are the chemicals that we put into the colonies to control the mites. Uh, and while those chemicals are being put into the colonies, uh, while they are miticides, they're specifically targeted to the mites, while they are uh, at doses that are sublethal to the bees, uh, these combinations of chemicals, uh, the fungicides, the herbicides, and then the, the, the levels of, uh, of chemical miticides that the bees are being exposed to, we don't actually know what all of those interactions do to a colony. It's very difficult to describe and adequately study all of those interactions all at the same time. Uh, we're also bringing all of those chemicals into the environment in a regular basis. And environmentally, it's just not uh, the best way to do things. And while it's important um, for chemicals to be a part of uh, integrated pest management, uh, we would hope that uh, the direction that we take things in as researchers is one where we can be uh, uh, reducing more and more and more uh, the, the amount of chemicals that are put into the environment. And so my hope is that we can find a way uh, to introduce something, uh, uh, some sort of means uh, into the, uh, the feed uh, of the bees that will go um, uh, to the fat body. Uh, and when the mites then feed, they'll be exposed to this. Now, I am hoping that we won't have to rely on um, a, a chemical uh, insecticide. Um, the work that I'm working on right now has nothing to do with uh, specifically putting putting an insecticide into the uh, the bees themselves. And my worry about that is that uh, it's there's been a lot of work on getting a systemic insecticide into bees and having it persist in their blood. And that was back when we thought that the mites were feeding on the bees' blood. And that was less of a concern because uh, the blood is renewed throughout the, the bee's life uh, cycle, um, the same way that our blood is renewed. However, uh, we don't get new organs every day. Like that's, that's a, the, the replacement of, uh, of tissues in the body, you're not gonna just get a new heart over time. Um, it, it takes a long time for those cells to be replaced. And so the, the fat body, things that are fat soluble have the potential to store in the fat body and eventually biomagnify into something that can be really detrimental to the colony. Um, my hope uh, is to, um, uh, to, to, to work on finding a way to disrupt uh, some sort of process in the mites that the bees don't have. Because the mites and bees are from totally different classes, different orders, uh, their bodies work pretty differently in a number of ways. And if we can target a function that the mites have, that the bees don't have, uh, then we have a system where we can uh, knock out a function that's essential uh, to the mites themselves and still allow the bees uh, to persist and be happy uh, without the addition of, of lots of different uh, chemicals into the system. Um, now, I know that that was a long answer, 
Eventually, that's going to be cut up into a much shorter <laughs> answer. Uh, but what I don't want people to hear me saying is that uh, I think chemicals uh, are uh, something that shouldn't be used in colonies and that we should all go as chemical, uh, chemically free. Um, I think that chemicals have a place under certain circumstances. But what we forget is that integrated pest management means that you don't just use chemicals. You find uh, some way... Uh, to, uh, from better understanding of the organism that you're attempting to impact, uh, you find other ways of impacting this creature and you only use chemicals uh, when necessary, uh, when things reach uh, a certain threshold, uh, when you desperately need to reduce the population of the organism and other means have failed. Uh, and oftentimes chemicals become the, the first go-to because we know it's really quick. You can stick these strips in the colony, close it up, walk away, uh, problem solved. And so we don't want that to uh, be the the thing that we immediately go to because of the ways that it impact, impacts the rest of the environment, the bees, uh, the ways that it can get into uh, our food and, and enter the, the human food chain. Uh, and so, yeah, think, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you've given it some, given it some consideration. <laughs> that was a perfect long answer. It was. Uh, I, I think, no, it was. It, mm-hmm. it brings all, all of the, or as far as I know, all of the points that need to be addressed here uh, from no poison to all poison or only poison and lots of things in between. Um, I'm, I'm, I am amazed at how, how much we missed this target um, over the years. And I'll, I, I was talking to you earlier about working with Dr. Eric Erickson when he was looking at the guanine deposits and cells of the fecal matter of mites. And it got taken then as far, only as far as it was an indication there were mites in your colony because there were fecal deposits there. He was working with the people that you picked up on also eventually, but uh, they only used it as a, as a, as a road sign that said, you know, mites here, as opposed to, what is this stuff and what should they be using? So the next step was... Well, it's worth considering that people usually don't like to focus on poop too much. So. <laughs> 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 Takes a special kind of researcher. I, I, yes, it's <laughs> I can't argue with that, yes. <laughs> so yeah. what, on that note... <laughs> <laughs> You're at the Beltsville I Lab? I love being at the Beltsville Lab. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll give you a heads up, and uh, uh, we're talking with Jay. We're going to be looking at all of the people working at the Beltsville Lab here coming down the mm-hmm. road. So uh, uh, the show that we're doing, it's called the Kim and Jim Show, and we will be looking at what you're doing. Okay. Hopefully you can do some of that. And speaking of looking at, I know that in uh, our next issue of Bee Culture Magazine, you were talking with mm-hmm. Ann Harmon. I did a short interview with her. And you send along some pictures of of the mite uh, actually penetrating that membrane Precisely. you were talking about and and feeding on the fat mm-hmm. body. You had a cross section, and um, there you are. That you know, question asked, question <laughs> answered. That that problem, that pretty much solves all of the things that you were talking about with that one photo. It was great. <laughs> so I, I encourage people to take a look at the December issue so you can see that, but also to check the. Kim and Jim show coming up um, sometime soon, Jay said, and maybe we can get a little closer look at some of the things that you were doing. Uh, uh, Jeff, yeah. you've got a little less experience with this than, than even I do, and I certainly don't have this much experience that uh, 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 Dr. Samp does. What What's your opinion of this just kind of from a less, less experienced perspective? Well, excuse me. I th- actually... It's pretty exciting. I, I have so many different thoughts that want to jumble out of my mouth right now that, that it's hard to really isolate. There's there's a couple of them. One that, and, and this is not to criticize anybody who's currently researching, but are there other Dr. Samuel Ramsey's ready to burst through and look at old research and challenge and question it out there that, I mean, we, we've, I, you know, even though, I mean, there seems to be a lot of research out there that could be either reinvestigated or can be continued on, worked on by a new group of, of researchers. And I think that would be fun to see and see. I think if, if they're all like you, then beekeepers are in good hands as far uh, as I'm well, concerned. 
First of all, I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I I also should, um, I guess I should give a little bit of, of, of detail about what goes into a project like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is risky um, in a lot of ways to decide that you're going to go back and look at things that were done in the past because the way that our system for uh, for for giving degrees, the way that it works, is that well I shouldn't say giving degrees earning degrees <laughs> you, when you when you receive your degree as um, a, a doctoral level researcher uh, what's been shown is that you're able to give an original contribution to the scientific community uh, we now know something that we did not know before um, and it, it is when you go back and you look at old work if you can't see your way to showing something that wasn't already clear from that older work, uh, you're going to have to start over and keep chugging along and uh, with, with different projects until you find something. And so it can be kind of risky because these days you don't want to be a, a career PhD student. Uh, all of <laughs> us have heard the stories of people who have been in graduate school for you know a, a decade or longer, or uh, who have been in a PhD program for a decade or longer. Because these days it's not too hard to be in grad school for a, uh, a decade or longer. But uh, it it can be really difficult when um, you're you're trying to figure out um, to to find your way in a PhD program and to better. Uh, to better understand how you can contribute something to the scientific community. Now, when I started looking at the subject of Varroa and their feeding, I noticed enough discrepancies where I couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, there were enough odd little things here and there, and there's, there was no single thing. Uh, it, we can't just focus on the, the subject of the poop. There was no single thing uh, that left me thinking the mites aren't feeding on the... Uh, the bee's blood, there was this confluence of, of different things. Uh, the, the mites feeding inside of the cell, uh, they are able to produce an egg uh, that is a substantial volume of their own body volume uh, every 30 hours. They're producing this baby uh, that is greater than 30% their own body volume. Uh, and to be able to do that every 30 hours is absolutely crazy. But to be able to do that when feeding on something that is pretty much water uh, with a little bit of nutrients uh, sprinkled in there, that just didn't seem to make a lot of sense with what I understood from from, from biology, uh, from digestion, from uh, nutritional analyses. It just didn't seem to make uh, a lot of sense Uh, at the... Uh, the the excrement that they were producing uh, was one matter, but also the the digestive system itself didn't seem like it was structured in a way to accommodate uh, a huge volume of of fluid. Um, their digestive system is just this tube. Uh, it's a tube that bifurcates and runs all the way down to the rectum, uh, but it doesn't do what uh, you would expect in an organism that's processing a lot of fluids because there usually is a, a some place where you are able to exchange all of the excess water out of that diet so you can concentrate all the nutrients in it. So if you're going to feed on something that is a very, very dilute fluid, the way that aphids feed on um, a plant sap or the way that um, uh, 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 certain insects like, you know, triatomines, um, uh, or sorry, that's a, a, a certain type of, <laughs> of, of true bug uh, related to bed bugs and other insects. Uh, if they're going to, to pierce um, a, a mammal, uh, and they need to get rid of all the excess water that is in the blood meal that they're going to consume and then concentrate the, uh, the nutrients from the blood itself. There's a number of different uh, physiological changes that are necessary for you to accommodate that. Uh, and we weren't seeing any of them in Varroa. Uh, and so it's, it was those sorts of things where when I started this, and I think I would recommend this to anybody who wants to look through old literature, I am sure that there is plenty um, in the the old literature. There are plenty of subjects that sound like they're all sewn up and, uh, you know, there's a, a neat little bow on it. Uh, but if you start looking at things and you see multiple discrepancies, start looking into uh, how those things could fit together and what they may be saying about what you're looking at. Um, I... I 
did not go looking for um, a project that would make me a rebel or anything of the sort. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was quite the opposite. I was trying to find a nice, quiet project and keep my head down. And so when I started this project, um, I was uh, um, coming off of uh, a totally different project in a different, um, working on a different system. I was working on parasites of stink bugs. Uh, and I'd spent two and a half years working on that already. And so I only had three more years to finish my PhD. And that project, um, I wasn't able to continue on with that project. I needed a new project that was going to get me all the way through. And so when I started talking about this idea of Varroa Dennis, I was still juggling a bunch of other ideas at the same time. And I needed to figure out what to settle on. And so I told Dennis, I've got some expectations of these mites. And if uh, these expectations aren't met um, pretty early on in what I'm able to determine from the literature and maybe some quick experiments on my own, uh, then I, I might find reason to pursue this project. But right now I'm keeping my options open. And the idea was that I would shut down those other options if I realized along the way, okay, there's, there's more to this story that's been shown. Um, and that's what kept coming up. The things that I just disclosed to you and, and plenty of other things I kept surfacing. So if you start seeing things that really uh, bother you, that you can't stop thinking about, and they're just sort of uh, uh, floating around in your head, uh, it might be worth pursuing that. But you know, develop some expectations. Uh, figure out what sorts of, of things you expect to see in that system and what it might be saying. Uh, that's great, great advice. Mm-hmm. You brought up a subject, and, and I'm sitting here thinking with a third of my brain thinking something just a little bit different. Where does the jump from Serena to Mellifera uh, play in here? Because um, Serena was drones only. And when they jumped, and, and, and there are people who say it was the random change of one gene that allowed Varroa to go from drones only on Serena to drones and workers on Mellifera. And I, I have now, you know, as much as I know, and I have, I don't know very much at all, but that question, that question is you were talking about this came to the top here. And do you have a thought on that? Is there, is that any role at all in this? I like you, Kim, you've got great <laughs> questions. I can tell you. <laughs> um, I love the subject of Apis Serena. Um, if, if people are looking for other uh, PhD projects or other really important things that need to be studied, uh, it's also a good idea to start looking outside of the U.S. Because if you've noticed, pretty much every 10 years, we get a new parasite of some some sort or a new disease of some sort. And it usually comes from some other country. It comes from uh, Southeast Asia where there are tons and tons and tons of different species uh, of honeybees. There's, uh, it's debatable. Uh, some researchers will tell you there's uh, 11 species of uh, honeybees in Southeast Asia. Some will tell you there's nine, but um, pretty much they have every species of honeybee. Um, and then Apis uh, mellifera is, uh, is there as well. And it's that exchange uh, of parasites and diseases and things between all of them that has created this system where we keep seeing these these new uh, what what are new to us but these organisms showing up that uh, can be really uh, really damaging to Apis mellifera because they simply don't have uh, an evolutionary history of constantly being exposed to parasites. The bees in Southeast Asia. Every species of honeybee that exists, uh, exists in Southeast Asia. And because they've all been hanging out, that's where the parasites hang out. Because the parasites have tons of options of what they're going to feed on and how they're going to feed. And uh, if uh, one of the sets of bees is migrating, they might be able to shift to another set of bees. Um, and so if you really want to, to study and, and, and be proactive about what could be showing up in the future, what's going to be the next big issue, um, or you want a better understanding of how bees naturally control parasites and disease uh, in the wild, you're, you're going to need to look at uh, some, some other species of bees uh, because Apis mellifera, um, there are debates about whether uh, Apis mellifera was uh, originally from Southeast Asia and moved out of Southeast Asia into Europe. And uh, there's lots of debate about this. But what we do know with uh, a, a good deal of, of certainty is that Apis mellifera has been separated from the Asian honeybee for a long, long time. And what we know uh, from our understanding of physiology and evolution is that if an organism has 
some sort of defense against another creature. And it's anything more than a passive uh, defense. If it takes some level of energy or some resources during development, uh, when that parasite is no longer around, uh, what will then be favored is the biology that lacks that per particular adaptation. Uh, and eventually, uh, the organisms that lack that adaptation will become the dominant version. And so Apis mellifera, lacking all the adaptations to combat these parasites, has become the dominant uh, 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 honeybee uh, uh, because it didn't need those adaptations anymore after it moved out of Southeast Asia and no longer had those parasites. Well, well, what what that brings up then is, uh, uh, um, what else are you studying over in that part? Of I the am world? studying. Um, so, I'm studying the tropolalaps mite because I am pretty confident. Uh, I don't want people to think I've got a crystal ball or anything, or I know what's going to happen in the future. But if we are to learn from history, um, I, I have uh, some level of confidence that tropolalaps is going to be the next introduced parasite right, into the U.S., um, for the next introduced parasite of honeybees into the U.S. And the concern there is that... Uh, we're going in a similar direction that we went in before, where we're kind of waiting until something happens before we do a substantial amount of research about this creature. Uh, originally, uh, it wasn't until Varroa arrived in the country uh, when that country started doing research about this creature. And that's why there's a bunch of early research done in China and in the uh, former USSR uh, about Varroa. That's where all the fundamentals were done because those are the first two places where it really became a big issue after moving out of Southeast Asia. Um, now all the work that's being done about tropolalaps impacting uh, different sets of bees, that's being done in China uh, and it's being done in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and if we really want to make sure that we can uh, uh, know as much about these creatures uh, as we could possibly know before they arrive, we really need to start making sure that we're uh, putting energy and resources towards better understanding it. And so uh, I have actually been crowdsourcing and raising uh, money uh, to go and study this organism because it's been more difficult to get this funded through uh, the regular means of, uh, of funding these sorts of studies. Um, I've, I've heard a few times now that parasite isn't here yet, uh, and we're going to put these resources towards the parasite that actually is here and is um, it is impacting our bees. But notice that that individuals, those individuals, uh, were willing to say that organism isn't here yet. There is a <laughs> an understanding that it is on its way, but it's not here yet. Um, and <laughs> I like the idea of being proactive. So I'm studying this parasite tropolalaps because it is kind of terrifying. Uh, it's about a third the size of Varroa destructor, so it's much more difficult to see. Um, but it it is uh, a substantially faster breeder. Uh, it breeds more quickly, um, and uh, part of the reason for that is because it re-enters brood cells much more quickly than Varroa destructor does. While Varroa spends, uh, on average, seven days uh, on adult bees and as long as um, two weeks, uh, the tropical Laylapse might spend uh, a day or less uh, on adult bees, and usually substantially less than a day, usually around 12 hours or so. Well, <clears throat> you've opened up an opportunity for the beekeeping community to, <clears throat> excuse me, to make an investment in its future here, I think. And I invite you to tell me right now, how do I do oh, that? Well, didn't want to do a shameless plug, but since you wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually... Uh, log on uh, to GoFundMe. And if you type in GoFundMe slash fund honeybee research, you will find my page. Also, uh, if you Google fight the mite, <laughs> you will find uh, my page because it is uh, called the fight the mite initiative. Uh, and I am working on uh, figuring out how to fight this mite before it even arrives. Because if we have a better understanding of this organism's biology, um, we might be able to uh, accomplish something that rarely happens when a parasite is introduced. Usually a parasite is introduced and we spend a good 10 to 20 years doing research on it before we have a good idea of what we can do to get rid of it. If the parasite is introduced and we already have ideas about what are effective tools and management measures that can be used against this organism, we can dramatically impact this population and maybe even eradicate it at its point source uh, rather than allowing it to spread to the entire U.S. before we start figuring out what to do about it. Um, so... 
it, we did we did a good job with that with yeah, Varroa. I agree. Uh, and 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 that should be our model of what not to do again. I think. Uh, so, anyone listening, do do something noble here, and then spread the word. I think uh, I think we could. Uh, we, we will be well better off if we uh, start now rather than before it gets. Well, I appreciate here. that. I will share your uh, GoFundMe uh, website on in Thank the in, in the liner notes here. Liner notes. Thank you. I'm not dating myself there in no. the podcast notes. <laughs> <laughs> we actually just reached. Uh, so my my goal is uh, twenty five thousand three hundred eighty two dollars, uh, and that will allow me to. Uh, complete the the complement of research uh, in Thailand on this project. Uh, and that's uh, me trying to f- figure out what is a reasonable amount and trying to distill that down into uh, the most economical way to, to get all of this done. Uh, and originally, I thought that's a huge amount of money. No one's ever going to, uh, through crowdsourcing, uh, be able to actually do that. But uh, through donations, both large and small, but mostly a bunch of small donations, uh, we've raised $16,633 uh, $16, so far, uh, which is wonderful. So there is one final push before March. Uh, I need to uh, assemble all of this money before March. Uh, so trying to do one last big push. Uh, the GoFundMe page doesn't uh, fully reflect that amount. It actually says $9,001 right now. Uh, and that is because some people have opted to uh, a- avoid having GoFundMe take its I think 4%, 4 or 5% cut uh, off the top. And so they've actually sent those checks directly to the U.S. Oh, nice. uh, and so that's gone directly into the account there. But yes, uh, 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 beekeepers can do a lot. Uh, I've, I've seen it just by disseminating this to their groups. Uh, so, so thank you very much. If you would uh, email me the address for if someone wants to contri- contribute directly. And it's on the I'll, GoFundMe page. Oh, is it? Okay. Mm-hmm. I'll make sure to include that in the notes of the podcast as well. Yeah, you bet. All right, Kim, I think we've monopolized enough of uh, Dr. Ramsey's time <laughs> this afternoon. I can keep going. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I got enough disk space here to, to record for the rest of the week, but uh, I'm sure Dr. Ramsey has better things to do. Well, I've got to say two more things. Please. I am a researcher. I've been a researcher forever, but I'm not. Uh, I, I feel like... Um, there is something to be said of having multiple interests. Uh, so something that uh, a lot of people have been asking about since EAS, I was actually asked uh, at the Eastern Apiculture Society meeting to... I was yeah. there too. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked at that meeting to, uh, to do the banquet, or prior to that meeting, uh, meeting to do the banquet. Um, and someone found online that I enjoy singing. Uh, and so uh, at the banquet, um, I, I just sang a bunch of songs and, um, and, and it was a lot of fun, but I've been surprised for a while now at how surprised people are um, <laughs> that researchers do other things aside from <laughs> research. But if you look at history, uh, some of the most, um, accomplished researchers, uh, of any age, uh, at, at any time period, we're also uh, musicians, we're also very interested in uh, several other forms of arts or interested in uh, other, uh, other disciplines. Uh, and so uh, I, I, en- I enjoy having that opportunity to show people uh, how multifaceted uh, researchers can be. Um, there's a lot of fun in that, but I, I think that sometimes that free form uh, that freeform way of thinking that you can get from certain styles of music uh, can actually help uh, relax your mind and um, uh, focus you in, in more creative ways. Um, and I, I think that has a lot to do with uh, me being more willing to pursue uh, odd ideas and how I pursue my research. Um, I don't think that I'm, um, people uh, have asked before, uh, we missed something big. In, in, I can't believe we missed this uh, about the mites. And you know, it, it, it's crazy that so many researchers working on this missed something this big. You must be really intelligent to have figured this out. Uh, and while I'm not going to downplay that, you know, I, I know that I'm a, a hard worker, and you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, <laughs> I'm, a I'm a tough cookie. I'm a sharp knife. But uh, I do know, though, uh, that. I don't think that I'm, I'm any smarter than the other researchers who have tackled these sorts of subjects. But I think that uh, a willingness to look at things differently is really important. And that brings me to my second point. Um, I think diversity 
is very, very important in science. And so shameless plug here for diversity. There's been a lot of rhetoric going around lately that uh, you know there are all these ideas of diversity for diversity's sake, and there's no real value in diversity. We just like it because it, uh, it, it, it sounds good or it makes us feel better or blah, 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 snowflakes. Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think diversity is really important and can be shown through the work that I've accomplished because the uh, even the with the rearing system that uh, that I came up with for feeding the mites, it wasn't that that system was uh, better than other systems in the past. Uh, I just took some uh, I, I took some odd approaches to being able to feed these organisms. I took some odd approaches to understanding how these creatures uh, impact the adult bees um, and. I think as long as we continue allowing for science to be uh, a system where uh, the vast majority of people are of the same race, the same gender, the same background, uh, we will have people trying to solve problems the same ways. And I think as we introduce people from different backgrounds, different cultures, I'm not sure if people know this, I am brown. Um, (laughs) As we introduce people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. Uh, Problems can, uh, a lot of problems can be solved in different ways than we would have ever imagined that they would be. And so just the plug for diversity there. (laughs) I like it. That's very good. I like it. Diversity in all of its forms and factors. I like it a lot. Absolutely. All right, Kim. You share the stage with some other great beekeeper musicians, if you're not aware of C.C. Miller and some Uh, of those. Yes, so that's good. Jeff, this has been uh, great. I'm glad that we were able to line this up. Uh, uh, the good doctor has spent uh, more than an hour with us, and, and we appreciate your time. We hope to visit you again on the Kim and Jim show, and you can show some of what you've been talking about here today. Uh, what have we got left, Jeff? I think that's it. I just want to extend the offer that uh, anytime you want to get out your message out to uh, the podcasting crew, that you uh, reach out to Kim and I, and we'd be happy to get you on at the drop of a drop of a uh, at the moment's notice. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, it's great to know that I uh, have that opportunity, that open offer available. You bet. All right. Thanks a lot, Doctor Ramsey. We look forward okay. to having Thank you back. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was really that was really something else, Kim. I, I it was just I I sat here most of the time just listening to him, not even thinking of what else to ask. He's just a wealth of information and and uh, and fun to listen to too. Yeah, the fun to listen to. You know, he has the he has the rare talent of being both a showman and an intellectual scientist, uh, and he's <laughs> incredibly good at both. And if if you haven't yet, certainly tune into his his uh, videos on on YouTube because. Um, they're entertaining, and you heard him today. You can tell the other half of what he does uh, in his spare time. I think the information, Jeff, that he had today really is, I said it at the beginning, I think it really is a game changer Yeah, uh, in terms yeah, I agree. of how we're going to be addressing the varroa problem from now on. And and he's not stopping. He's looking into the future. He's, his, what I liked about today was what's next yeah. as opposed to, how do I fix what's broken now? I'm looking for what's going to break in the future so that I'm ready for it. And to me, that is, that's, that's as good as it gets. And I'm, I'm hope I'm wishing him all of the success he has. Uh, if you, if you recall, um, he's looking for funding. He's got a, uh, 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 fundraiser going. And I think we didn't, we have the address on there. If yes. I, we'll have it up on the website we'll in, the, on the in the website. show notes. If, uh, mm-hmm. if it's still going when you hear this, and he's looking for external funding plus uh, USDA funding. So, to me, it was it was um, this was a good day to be here, Jeff. It was. I really liked his message about the diversity in terms of bringing all sorts of different approaches to the problems t- that we are experiencing. So, his uh, unfamiliarity with honeybees and ma- honeybee management and everything else gave him a different perspective on the problem that um, that people have taken for granted, I guess. And, and that's not a, a bad mark on anybody else who's been doing all this research for the last 30 years or so, but it just, it just brings a new energy to the problem. And it's, uh, it's, it's fun to see. It's really fun to see. Yeah. I think that about wraps it up for today, Jeff. I think, I think, well, we certainly want to thank Larry Connor and Wick Wasp Press 
publisher of dozens of how-to how -to and scientific beekeeping books for sponsoring this podcast today. You can find out more about Wickwas at www.wickwas.com. Go out and take a look at their newest publications and give them a high five for be, uh, helping bring us this great program today. Well, that about wraps it up for this special holiday replay of our first interview with Dr. Sam Ramsey. We talked with him again this past July, Season 3, Episode 8, about the <laughs> Tropolet Laps mite. That's another one you'll want to listen to. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for becoming the latest supporter of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, at the end of this year, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments to questions at Beekeeping Today podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Happy holidays, everyone. Stay safe.